Hi, and welcome to TTELT, Teaching Tips for English Language Teachers, a program of educators worldwide. I'm your host today, Melanie Gobert. Hello, everyone. This is Melanie Gobert, your host for today's episode of TTELT, Teaching Tips for English Language Teachers, a program of educators worldwide. Joining me today are Aisha Arif and Shweta Kumari of New York University, Abu Dhabi, where they are writing instructors. Today, we're going to be talking about perceptions and positions of post-colonial English. What do you mean exactly, Aisha, by perceptions and positions of post-colonial English? So in the world today, uh, we have so many varieties of English. Um, and I'll clarify what I mean by that, because um, a lot of us think about English as one singular standard when that doesn't necessarily exist anymore because of the diversity of the different types of people who are speaking them, the different cultural backgrounds they come from, and also the different languages that they speak alongside English. So alongside those varieties of English, for example, somebody might speak a British English, there might be somebody speaking American English, both of which are seen largely as standard Englishes. Um, I personally, for example, speak Singaporean English. Shreta here speaks Indian English, um, which might be seen as non-native uh, Englishes. So because of that, it is tied to a lot of the perceptions of how the speakers are perceived and seen to be in terms of compatibility, uh, compatibility in terms of competence, in terms of um, how able they are to succeed in life. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are some of the ways that you foster inclusivity in the multicultural classroom? So I think we want the teachers and educators and everybody in the classroom to first be aware that these are varieties. There are various different varieties of Englishes. They exist and they should be incorporated in their teaching, learning you know, practices. Um, so awareness and be aware of your implicit biases and then be transparent and open to your students and in classrooms that they are each one of us speaking English and you know we should be able to own it. We should, you know, there's a theory about ownership to the language. And I think if I can speak the language, I should be able to own it and I should be able to seen as the native speaker of that in that language in itself. So you know with teaching, I think we should start by being aware ourselves and raising their awareness and then also translating that into practice maybe in when i'm evaluating their essays or when i'm teaching them grammar when i'm teaching them content i think it can all be part of all the teaching practices and what it does that does to students is it makes everyone feel empowered and it makes everyone feel like they belong and they have an agency and it fosters confidence as well Okay, let's get down to a little bit of nitty gritty on this, okay? I accept that Singaporean English is a variety of English and Indian English is a variety of English as much or perhaps even more so than American English because I think if we're going, if we're judging by colonial standards, you were colonized, your countries were colonized by uh, the UK before my own, okay? So where, so I accept that perfectly, okay? But for teachers, and professors, what about errors? You know, what's the line between variety of English and mistakes in English? So one of the large things that we are trying to share and perpetuate is this idea of prioritizing intelligibility and understanding. It's different, so bad English is bad English. However, varieties of English should not be seen as bad English. And the line is drawn where um, there are certain standards that are being held to based on a specific variety of English. Typically, those are British English or American English. At the same time, though, there are certain sayings and um, usages of the language which are very specific to the context that they exist in. So, for example, I think Shweta is a really good example um, on 
the word pressing, which uh, yeah, yeah, could you yeah. Share that? So I mean, um, for for example, in Abu Dhabi, in the context of multi multicultural um, place, there was a sign of a shop names. It was like the um, clothes pressing, and the clothes pressing it communicates the message to perhaps the people who need to identify this is the shop where they can take their clothes and get it ironed, right? So if it appears in the context of, let's say a journal article, I would edit it to suit the context to make it like ironing clothes instead of clothes pressing. But if it works in the context of communicating that message, then it works. So that's what I think an error is an error, as Aisha said, mm -hmm. but if also a variety should not be taken as an error. And also it's very important to see us where is the, in what context is it working or not working? Okay, so let me just push you a little bit on this because ironing for me and pressing your clothes, they're equally acceptable. I accept equally both usages with my standard American mm -hmm. English. So why would a professor find fault with that? <laughs> um, I think one of the ways why a professor would find it uh, wrong is because of their own inherent training mm -hmm. and what they have inherited from their you know, years and years of learning um, that they might want to perpetuate the same say like, you know, because this is the, um, and sometimes we see that in the, in the classroom also, um, professors get to decide what style I will accept. And, and that's okay because as students, you want to learn to be able to translate and transfer your education to suit a particular need. As long as that professor is being um, very vocal and I think there is clear instruction. So I know what I'm going to ju be judged on. Because if I don't know what I'm going to judge, judge on, I am at a disadvantage. Okay, well, let's talk about some of the ways the internet is erasing these uh, differences and these different varieties. So that's an excellent point because the thing is with, especially the younger generations and the younger generations of English learners, one other big thing is that the conversation typically circles around native versus non-native speakers. But we argue that that is a really outdated version of thinking about it because something that is, you know, you're born speaking or you grew up speaking in your early years, you might have a certain competence to it. But then with a lot of this generation at this point, you have speakers of English primarily. So we argue that, you know, maybe using the terms primary and secondary speakers would make a little bit more sense there because for example, somebody might grow up um, in India speaking Hindi as a first language, or maybe in China speaking Chinese as a first language. But then in the context that they're growing and interacting with others, the primary language that they are using is English. And because of that, their competence, their knowledge, and their skills is being developed based on the amount of use, not in terms of like the time boundness of it. So we then base and judge the English based on how often they're using it, what context they're using it in, instead of which one they're learning first. Because yes, the native language can color um, what other second, third languages they're picking up. But then where English has become such a lingua franca, especially over the internet, especially um, in situations where you are communicating with people through social media, through um, you know internet platforms, through things like AI and chat GPT. Mm -hmm. um, it is a functional language to bridge the gap between all of these different languages. We have to account for that because the way that students learn nowadays is also completely different. The way that the kind of language that students are picking up are also a lot more flat in the sense that they are not bound by one specific type of English. So us as educators, we need to be aware of that because if not, we're just going to be held to certain standards that are completely outdated while new, more um, diplomatic, I would say, uh, versions of learning and language acquisition are taking place. Well, could that not also be just a problem of uh, register or genre? Because 
young people, obviously, when they write their essay to try to get into college, it shouldn't be the same essay they write after they finish the first year. So are professors not aware that students need to be taught the, the, the genre of academic writing? And that's not just your job. They do. I think, um, you know, like a lot of teachers sometimes also have to struggle how much because, you know, there's only limited time. So sometimes they struggle with how much time I can dedicate to teaching the content and teaching the craft. Um, so it's, it's a hard balance, but we do like to believe that everyone who is teaching the content is also, in fact, teaching the craft of writing of the language. Um, so they are aware, but I think we need to do more in terms of not only being aware and wanting to do it, but also like making room for that in the classroom and in the syllabus and in the time, the limited time that every semester um, professor has in the yeah. classroom. And beyond that, um, if we as educators are also thinking about not just the grammar and the syntax and the sentence structures, but also instilling in them things like creative thinking, um, critical thinking, and also being having the dexterity to move across different forms of writing, that sort of code switching and ability to um, be flexible with the language, that is what we want to instill as educators because that is what is going to make somebody competent in you know, presenting their ideas and their messages without issue. It's not about having the perfect grammar sometimes, it's about knowing the context to use it because if you're going to use a college application level or a, a, an academic essay writing style of English, in everyday speech, it's going to sound extremely stilted. It's going to be very awkward. Mm -hmm. If you come into a job interview and start saying that, I argue that I would be a good candidate because <laughs> that would just be extremely weird. So we should be able to teach the soft skills alongside the grammar and the syntax and the technical stuff, because that's what makes good language speakers. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Aisha and Shweta. I really appreciate you joining me today on today's podcast of TTELT, Teaching Tips for English Language Teachers, a program of educators worldwide. This has been your host, Melanie Gobert. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. Share with us how you are using these tips. Leave us a comment or voice message on social media or at ttelt.org. Thanks for joining this episode of TTELT, brought to you by Educators Worldwide. Follow, like, and subscribe to TTELT on your social media. And try a new teaching tip today.